what we're talking about here tonight is a huge spiritual uh, challenge to even face. It requires a lot of spiritual fortitude. And all of you sitting here who are willing to learn more about this are really to be congratulated. You're among the bravest people and um, in, in the area, for sure. And we really, really, really appreciate um, all of your, your efforts. And uh, I hope you can get galvanized to do even more after tonight and hearing all the speakers that are here tonight. Um, we live along the West Marin Coast, and in uh, this beautiful, beautiful uh, state, along all along the coast will be accumulating more radiation from Fukushima. And when I face that reality, it was like facing an individual death. I didn't at first, I didn't want to really believe it. I was in denial. Then I was so furious. And then um, I, I thought, well, you know, maybe it isn't so bad, bargaining. And then I finally accepted, yes, we're going to have to deal with this. And all, all the rest of the generations of the human species is going to have to deal with what is going on now at Fukushima. And unfortunately, Fukushima isn't the only site that this could happen at. And uh, you'll, you'll understand uh, if you don't already. How many people here have been following this very closely? Uh, so, okay, thank you. When the explosions at Fukushima occurred in March of 2011, Clouds of uh, cesium-134 and 137 were shot up into the air and then into the jet stream and was carried across the jet stream all over the planet. Um, there were people who were saying, oh, let's go to the southern hemisphere, but you know what? The southern hemisphere showed elevated re a spike in radiation uh, not too many months afterwards. So first it, it went across the Pacific and then up uh, Alaska and then, and it's, it's covering the planet there as you can see. And this was um, from those explosions that created this cloud of radioactive um, debris. Then, as uh, we now know that TEPCO, the, co the company that operates the Fukushima Daiichi plants, has been dumping contaminated water into the ocean constantly, every day, since the, um, the catastrophe first occurred. They can't really help it. I mean, they could if they had done early on what um, some engineers have, have suggested, like Arnie Gunderson, but they have groundwater flowing through. The groundwater um, picks up the contamination from the melted through um, reactors, as well as the water that's created by trying to keep those reactors cool and trying to keep the spent fuel pools cooled, all of which would um, create even worse problems if they weren't constantly uh, inundated with water. This shows how the um, ocean currents move through the entire planet, the global conveyor uh, belt. You've heard about the Gulf Stream in the Atlantic. Well, there's one similar in the Pacific. That's the Kuroshio Current. And what it, it does is it starts forming right, going very deep right in front of Fukushima. And then it's, um, it moves across and up, see, over to the North Pacific. Um, goes up to Alaska, along Alaska, and then down the entire west coast 
of North America, and then it loops back again. And then the convergence zone there, where the North Pacific gyre is, where all the plastic congregates, you know, the, and has been um, moved, it's sort of like the belly button of the Pacific. And that's where the concentrations are the highest of the radiation right now. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA, along uh, with uh, the GEOMAR Research Center for Marine Geosciences, have put together a, a simulation based on a tracer cl a cloud that they've injected dyes into the ocean. And what that showed was this kind of dispersal. And they can see the days above um, there on the upper left, and how f quickly it's moving through the ocean. Because there's, there are, there's surface currents as well as the, um, the looping currents. And what that uh, has shown in their simulation, and by the way, their simulation was based on only one release of about a couple of weeks. They didn't say how exact uh, they were, but as we now know, this is a continuing release. So that has to be added into their understanding when they did this simulation. But it's still useful to see how it moves and disperses throughout the Pacific. Uh, what they're saying is that the concentration, because the, the current is very strong uh, as it leaves Fukushima and it, it starts moving very quickly and, uh, and deep, deeply. Then when it gets along the, north, or the um, west coast of North America, it tends to slow down. And so they are saying that there may be an accumulation along the west coast of, these, um, of the radiation that may make our west coast actually more radioactive than uh, off the shores of Japan. So what, um, what we can see is that they're saying that this uh, current will reach the uh, northwest coast around 2014. Uh, it reaches Alaska before that and uh, then moves down Canada and, and down to where we are. Um, the Japanese have done measurements of plankton throughout the Pacific and 10 different places throughout the Pacific. And in every place they tested, there was elevated levels of cesium-134 and 137. The greatest concentrations were in this Pacific gyre area in the center that um, actually is northeast of Hawaii, I believe. Um, so let's talk about measuring. Um, shortly after the catastrophe, many of the government radiation monitors that uh, were supposed to protect us from um, inadvertent exposures were turned off. They, they uh, in their wisdom, decided that we didn't need to know any more about what was happening. But what happened was people in um, some universities measured the kelp off the shore of Long Beach and found that the levels of iodine-131 were elevated immediately after the catastrophe. And bluefin tuna, which are migratory fish that uh, actually spawn next to offshore in the uh, Fukushima area, did have cesium. And they, they were surprised about that because cesium can be excreted from the body, but uh, the, the fish actually still had uh, measurable levels of cesium in their flesh when they, by the time they got to uh, the West Coast where they were um, caught and, and checked. And so the second year, uh, after Fukushima, bluefin tuna were also, were again tested, and 15 out of 15 
also tested high in elevated levels of, of um, cesium. But the, the scientist who, who measured that um, said, oh, not to worry. Those levels are um, below our level of concern here in the United States. However, the United States permissible levels of uh, radiation, uh, the guidelines are 1,200 becquerels per kilogram, which is among the highest in the world. And so it, it's not health related, they just um, decided 1,200 um, becquerels per, and a becquerel is a decay per second, a disintegration of a radioactive particle per second. So it's okay to eat things that have 1,200 <laughs> um, becquerels per kilogram in your body. That's what they're saying. When you talk about radioactive contamination, the most severe damage occurs from the radioactive particles getting inhaled or ingested through food and uh, water, and then they lodge in your body. Uh, the body res uh, recognizes cesium the same as potassium. Just like you've heard about iodine, uh, 131 radioactive iodine is absorbed by our thyroids, which use iodine and, and must have iodine. Well, the same thing happens with cesium. Cesium is recognized as potassium, so it's taken into the muscle tissue. Um, it can get into your um, digestive tract, but that way you can flush it out if it's in your digestive tract through eating apple pectin, for instance. That's been proven by studies on children after Chernobyl. Strontium-90 is now, we're, we're seeing, as, has been measured in what's been released as well in the water. And strontium-90 gets absorbed as calcium and goes into the bones and to, into the teeth. So it would get into fish bones as well and, and teeth. And then that's harder to, it, it doesn't get excreted. So these are the things that we're, we're having to deal with now. And going back to the 1,200 becquerels per kilogram, Dr. Yuri Bandajewski, who is a medical doctor who's the head of the Medical Institute at Gomel Institute of Medicine in Belarus. After Chernobyl, he did testing of autopsies, of tissues from children's autopsies. And he found that cesium caused disease to begin at the level of 11 becquerels per kilogram. And that disease was permanent by the time it was 50 becquerels per kilogram. So if you constantly ingest food that is allowed to have 1,200 becquerels per kilogram, you can imagine how quickly that would um, get you into disease levels, and particularly children and pregnant women and um, infants. Uh, also, uh, the um, National Academy of Sciences, the biological effects of ionizing radiation, Beer 7 report from 2006, has shown, clearly states, that there is no safe level of radiation. And in fact, what they have shown is that children are, of course, more vulnerable the elderly, the infirm, and women are more susceptible uh, than men, and girl children are the most susceptible. This is our reproducing of our species that's at stake here. Um, and I, I'm reading more and more, by the way, um, studies that are showing the same thing is true for non-ionizing radiation, which is the wireless, the cell phones, and um, that women are, are more 
um, sensitive and girl children. Um, so what, what we, uh, one more fact about that when you ingest that um, radioactive particle, then this is different, you know, from x-rays, by the way. They, that just goes through. Those are waves. Gamma radiation, just waves. But if you have a particle of radiation, which is a heavy metal, it can lodge inside you and stay there forever, irradiating the cells right next to it, which, you know, is the way our, the body is, is affected. And then it, they tend to... in go into the organs, the lungs, the heart, the pancreas, the liver, etc., to cause problems. So what to do? Um, our organization joined with others to form Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, FAN, and we've got information over there. There's a lot more information than I'm going to be able to talk about now. Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network has submitted an official legal document to the FDA to demand that the permissible levels for radiation in food and supplements be lowered to five becquerels per kilogram and that they do systematic testing of our food and supplements. And we need um, support in that. We can talk with more detail over there. Um, Rachel is right there from Eon with an array of different herbs of all things. Now, these won't cure your problem from radiation, but they, there are studies that have been done that show that, for instance, cancer patients undergoing radiation treatments, which uses gamma radiation, not the particles, but anyway, we're hoping that these same herbs that fortify and help the survival rates from that kind of radiation may help with fortifying the body and somewhat diminishing the, the bad effects of uh, the particles that may get lodged in your, in your body. People say, eat seaweed. Seaweed um, I mean, some of the, the foods that we, we know were really um, to be looked for, mushrooms, seaweed, that before Fukushima were really good for you because they hyperaccumulated minerals. Well, those things are hyperaccumulating the radiation. So if they're in exposed water, they're going to be more highly contaminated than... Um, other foods. So uh, we, we have more um, information over there, uh, a lot more to think about, but uh, apple pectin can help flush through uh, cesium, and there are other ways of dealing with this that we could talk about afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>